Well, welcome to Ternova and welcome to my garage. We've been doing this home improvement project, which has been very much in vogue over the last uh, three months for everybody. And uh, while we've been working this week on uh, building out this surfboard shaping bay with my son, Caleb, it made me think of our Against the Flow series that we started uh, last weekend. Uh, Pastor John uh, started us, uh, us out on the book of Daniel. And uh, what's been on my mind all week is what we discovered about drawing the line, because that was Daniel's genius. He knew how to do that again and again. And drawing the line is necessary for, for any project. And, and with this project, trust me, as rank amateurs, we needed to draw some lines because we needed all the help that we could possibly get. And so we began to draw lines, uh, draw lines to make things level, draw lines in order to cut with a saw, Draw, drawing lines in order to paint with a brush, drawing lines in order to uh, uh, have the correct screw placement, and much, much more. Uh, so here's the thing, is that the lines are necessary if you're gonna build well, and if you're gonna live well. So how do you know which lines to draw? Well, that's where uh, we get some real clarity from Daniel's decision, is that he knew where to draw the lines about what he would do and what he wouldn't do based on a desire to honor God and God alone. And so here's what's cool. Uh, joining uh, us on this Terranova gathering, either in person or online, is a step in that direction. It's a step that we're all making, is that we want to uh, devote our time and attention to celebrating God and his goodness and getting to know him better. So right here, right now, uh, we're going to draw near. We're going to put God first. We're going to honor God. And I, and I think we'll be glad that we did. And, and a powerful way in which we honor God is through music and singing. So if you're online, you can go ahead and use that Terranoble app to find the lyrics. Okay, so are you ready? Let's go ahead then and enter into a time of honoring God as the band leads us. Hey, welcome, hey, welcome to Terranova. So, so glad, glad you're here in the room or online. I want to invite you to stand up as we celebrate tonight. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory. Yet with confidence strong near For the one who holds the heavens And commands the stars above Is the God who bends to bless us With an unrelenting love Rejoice Come and lift your hands and raise your voice He is worthy of all praise Rejoice of your King and with trembling rejoice we are children of the promise the beloved of the Lord one with everlasting kindness but with sacrificial blood bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of our Father Rejoice. To all our sickness, all our sorrow, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy and triumph, turning agony and praise. There is blessing in this battle, so take heart, stand amazed. Rejoice. When you cry to hear me, hears your voice. Oh, it will wipe away your tears. Rejoice in the midst of suffering. You will help you sing. Rejoice. Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. It's worthy. Oh, it's worthy. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King, and we 
so grateful for your love for us eradicates all the fear God we're just leaving it behind stepping into faith stepping into your love tries to roll over my bones 
When sorrow comes to steal the joy out of And when brokenness and pain is all I've known I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love And shame no longer has a place Oh, shame no longer has a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies Oh, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand Resurrection power that can save is power in your name. It's power in your name. It's power that can break up every chain. Oh, oh, there's power that can empty out a grave. It's resurrection power. Can say it's power in your name, it's power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. God, we thank you so much for your great love for us and in us and through us. God, thank you so much for that. Well, you guys can grab a seat. Go ahead. Go for it. Life is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. Uh I can't open this jar. See if mom can open it. Just take your time in there, okay? No means maybe. Hey, why don't you bring that ball inside and play with it? Hey, don't put that back where you found it. Just leave it on the floor. Ew, bacon. If you put a dent in the car, it's really no big deal. It's 10 a.m. Go back to bed. Look, whatever your friends are doing, just do the exact same thing. I got more than enough sleep last night. If your friends are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Stop signs are just a suggestion. You don't need a chaperone. You don't need a seatbelt. You don't need a savings account. You should buy the jeans with the holes in them. Hey, we're all gonna go to church, but you can just sleep in, okay? Can we please just hang out in here for another 10 minutes? Hey, can we get some more bickering back there? All right, bills. Yay, traffic. Woohoo, taxes. Yes, laundry. 
Hey, can you kids come in here and jump on my bed? Quick, go tell mom what happened right away. You don't need to finish your dinner. Hey, look at your phone when I'm talking to you. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason, texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna bungee jump out of this tree. That's a really good idea. All right, hey, that was fun, huh? Wow, happy Father's Day uh, to y'all. Uh, for all of you that are here in person at Turn of the Hub, and also for those of you um, that are watching online, um, isn't it great that we get a chance to celebrate dads this weekend? And it was maybe think about, you know, really life at its best is, uh, is man, uh, celebrating dad. And also life at its best, I think, deals with this combination that we've had to navigate lately. It's the combination between the things that are constant and the things that are changing, right? Uh, so, you know, one of the things that are constant is that the third weekend of every June, we get a chance to celebrate dads. Man, so good for that. Uh, so that's a constant. Uh, but, you know, change is good, too. You know, change, what, what do they say? Variety is the spice of life, you know? So I think about just some of the things that we're uh, really committed to, and that is uh, the constant of communicating really well I'm here at Terra Nova. But here's the change. Here's the wrinkle is that we're going kind of paperless in doing that. And uh, so in order for us to communicate uh, together is uh, we've got this Terranova app and then a bunch of you guys, you guys have your phones. You can go ahead and find the app on your phone. And what you'll find if you go to the Terranova app is the connect card. And uh, so the constant is communicating together. The changes we're doing electronically. And so we'd love to have everybody uh, go ahead and spend some time getting that Connect card and sending it in because we really love to hear from everybody. Uh, Connect card is super good for uh, letting us know also of how we can be praying for you this week. I know that a bunch of you use the Connect card uh, for that on a regular basis. Also, we thought we'd do something fun with the Connect card as it deals with dads. So dads, listen up to this. Uh, what we're going to be doing uh, for every dad that fills out a Connect card uh, and just writes, uh, I'm a dad, and then next to it writes the name of his favorite takeout place. For all the dads that do that, we're going to gather all those names together, and we're going to draw out three names, and we'll give those three dads, those three lucky dads, a gift card to their favorite takeout place. And so, so dad, here's your chance. Get in that Connect card. Write, I'm a dad, and the name of your favorite takeout place, and who knows, you could be a winner, and that'd be exciting. Uh, I'll tell you another thing that's actually really constant that we've seen over this, uh, this year, 2020. It's just uh, Turnover's commitment to generosity. Man, people have just been giving just in such a generous way, and that God's just been using that. It's just been amazing to see. Uh, it's just been blowing us away. But here's the change. The change is we're not passing baskets now, but instead we're doing a lot of the giving uh, through a, a variety of different options, some different options that we have. Um, and uh, the, the first option would be to use the Terranova app, uh, which we've talked to you all about. Um, you can always use the app. You can give online, and then you can also um, go ahead and... And, uh, and give uh, throughout the week. You can mail a check uh, or you can actually drop it off uh, to the hub. And so you can do those kinds of things. Uh, so fantastic. We're mixing it up a little bit, right? Change is good. Variety is the spice of life. Now, I'll tell you another thing, though, the kind of the last thing that is a real constant for us is our commitment to making God's love famous in our community and really trying to, uh, to spend some time uh, uh, directing energy to things that are really crisis things in our community. And one of those things is homelessness in our community. There's something that we're actually really concerned about. Homelessness is on the rise in our community, probably not a surprise to many of us. Uh, and some of you know that uh, one of the ways in which we uh, combat homelessness is by um, uh, this great uh, a transition house that we have in Lake Forest that's run by One Step Ministry, our ministry to single parents, and it's been going for a number of years, and we've had uh, people that have gone into that home uh, and their kids, and that they've uh, gotten a roof over their heads uh, with uh, what we call our house or the transition house. 
so that has been a constant thing. It's been constant for years, and, uh, and that we've just seen how that, that is one of the most really critical things for a person that's homeless or about to be homeless is to get a roof over their head. Once they get a roof over their head, is that a lot of other things can really begin to break well in their favor. And so we're making a commitment to that. We just believe that God's directed us towards that. So now here's the change. We're at, gonna be adding a second house. And we're gonna be, I know, it's exciting. And, uh, and to tell you a little bit more about that and how it is that you and I can participate in the launch of that second house, where it's going to be and what we're going to be doing, uh, you're going to have to, uh, to tune in or come back next week because we're going to tell you all about it uh, next weekend. And so anyway, super excited about it. And, and I know that uh, you're all going to want to play uh, in the second transition house uh, that we're going to use uh, to, uh, to really bless um, some folks that don't have a roof over their head right now but are going to. So anyway, it's just so great, and it's just so great, again, for us all to be together, either uh, uh, here in person or online. And so now, let's go ahead and dive into part two of Against the Flow. Again, uh, welcome, welcome to those of you who are watching online. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, and of course, to those of you who are in the room again, uh, happy Father's Day weekend. And particularly, thanks for spending part of your Father's Day weekend uh, right here with us as we are jumping into, Lyle said, part two of our series on the book of Daniel called Against the Flow. It's the story of four teenagers who were ripped from their homelands as prisoners of war, forced marched a thousand miles across the desert to Babylon, where they are indoctrinated and assimilated into Babylonian culture and worldview and beliefs, a worldview and beliefs, by the way, that are entirely opposite to their own culture and their own beliefs, ultimately to be brought into the central government of Babylon, where they will serve at the pleasure of the man who will eventually destroy their city and I'm in the light again, destroy their city and uh, kill many of the people that they know and love and care about. And one of the things I said last week that is most interesting to me about this book, about Daniel's story, is that for 70 years, Daniel worked for the good of Babylon, worked for the good of this city. In fact, he was so good. He was so helpful in his leadership, his administration, his advice giving, and so forth, that he, was, he and his friends are consistently promoted to the highest echelons of political power in the administration of the government. In other words, and this just, this just, this just grabs me, they were for the city. They were for the good of the city of Babylon, but they were against the flow. And again and again throughout the story, and, we, and, and Daniel just gives us, us of a few of these, they draw lines, if you will, as we said last week, where they say uh, with both incredible respect and tact, but also firmness and conviction, hey, we are for you and we are for what is good for you, but we can't go there with you. Our lives will honor God and God alone. And I find this so amazing that they didn't separate from the culture, which is what many people do. They didn't fight to oppose the culture. Again, popular choice. They didn't mindlessly assimilate into the culture. 
Again, something many people do. They didn't do this bipolar thing of private faith and public face. They found this other way. They found this fifth way that I think often eludes us. And that's why I think their stories have so much to say to us about what it looks like to live this genuine, authentic, non-obnoxious, respectful faith in a pluralistic world. I hope you'll join us for the entire series. But as we ended last week, Daniel and his friends have just graduated from the University of Babylon, summa cum laude, highest honors, and they're brought into their civil service jobs in the Babylonian government. Well, it was not long into their careers that something so dramatic happened that initially it looked like it would end in their execution, but ultimately actually catapulted them to unprecedented positions of power and influence in the government. Here's how the story goes. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, dreams that troubled his mind. He could not sleep. I don't know if you've ever had dreams like that. You ever have dreams and they're weird dreams and like recurring dreams, and, and they just keep coming back, and like you can't sleep. Every time you close your eyes, you see it again. Well, most of us don't really take dreams seriously. We certainly don't look to dreams as a means of guidance. When we have dreams like that, we usually blame it on like a bad burrito, right? But many ancient cultures, particularly Middle Eastern cultures, did. In fact, Babylonians definitely did. They were, in the words of Stevie Wonder, very superstitious. And so Nebuchadnezzar actually had in his employee an entire team of experts from the Institute of Futurology at the University of Babylon. No doubt some of these men, many of them had been teachers and professors of Daniel and his friends while they were in school there. And the king summoned his team of experts, summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. These guys are his advisors, the guys he looks to again and again, trained in the lore of divination, the reading of signs and stars and abnormal births and sheep livers and certainly, most certainly, dreams. And because Nebuchadnezzar is known, well known for killing anybody he wants when he's in a bad mood, they have become very adept at telling him what he wants to hear. But this time... It was different. When they came in to the throne room, they enter this vast throne room, they immediately detect a very grim look on their emperor's face. He is not having a good day, and the day has just started. He gets right to business. I have had a dream. It troubles me, and we want you to tell us what it was. And and the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever which is what you say to a man who can kill you because he woke up grumpy. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. They are confident in their abilities, their knowledge, their experience, to be able to to take the data that they've been given and give the interpretation, which was why, by the way, what interpreters, what, what experts do, right? They take data and tell you what it means. It's like you've heard the joke. A consultant is somebody who borrows your watch and tells you what time it is, right? And, and this is like they say, so give us the data. But to their horror, Nebuchadnezzar says, no, not today. The king replied to, this, to his astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut to pieces, and your houses turned into piles of rubble. This man knows how to deliver a threat. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive gifts and rewards and great honor. This is how these guys look, like on this razor edge of great glory and sudden death. That was their life every day. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. And they're like, I'm sorry, what did he just say? <laughs> did he what? Like, I'm sorry, did he, did he wants us to tell him the dream? And so once more, they reply, uh, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. But Nebuchadnezzar isn't buying it. This is amazing. Maybe he's actually forgotten the dream. I don't know if you've ever had a dream that just messed with you, but you couldn't remember it, like not in its entirety. Or maybe he's actually come to distrust them. Maybe he knows they have this way of just telling him what he wants to hear. And so the king answers, the king answers uh, 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 to them, I am certain you are trying to gain time. You are, you are just trying to play with me right now because you realize this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, 
There is one penalty for you. You have conspired to mislead me. You have conspired to, mis- to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping that the situation will change. You're trying to do some song and dance, some kind of smoke and mirrors. I see right through you. Tell me the dream, and then I'll know that you can interpret it. And now comes a turning point in the story that really sets up part of the meaning of this chapter. As they're pleading for their lives, they remind them this is entirely unprecedented. The astrologers answer the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king has asked. And by the way, in all of our records of astrology and divination, no king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of a magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks, it's too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. See, this kind of information, they say, this kind of information that you're asking for is possessed by the gods. And in this moment, they're forced to admit that they actually don't have access to that world. And for them, this is a difficult admission because many of them would have been priests, priests that serve at one of the thousand plus temples throughout the city to deities who control or influence every aspect of nature and life. And these were the guys who were supposed to be in touch with the gods. These were the guys who were supposed to have access to the gods that mere mortals like us could not have. It's what made them superior. It's what made them so powerful and so wealthy. And maybe, just maybe, Nebuchadnezzar has decided to test them on it. And this made the king so angry and so furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. A decree, by the way, which included Daniel and his friends who weren't even there that day. In fact, they're just kids right now. They're like late teens, maybe early 20s, 2021, you know, and they play a very junior role at this point in the administration. They weren't even asked to show up. In fact, some scholars think that at this point they may still be in school and this, that this story happens before the end of last week's story. But Nebuchadnezzar has lost faith in the whole lot of them. He's just done with them all and he wants them all dead. And so men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Can you imagine? It was Arioch, we're told, captain of the palace guard. That means this guy is a serious guy. Back up one. There we go. It is Arioch, commander of the king's guard, which means he is not a sympathetic individual. He is not a guy who blinks to kill someone that the king just asked him to kill. It is Arioch who has gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel spoke with him with wisdom and tact. Back up. With wisdom and tact. Yeah, with wisdom and tact. Now, this becomes a theme throughout the story. This is, like, this is Daniel's style. This is his way. That... that that even in a moment where Daniel's life is about to be taken, he's able to calm himself. Imagine this. He's like 20 years old. He's able to calm himself enough to speak with this man who's going to kill him in such a way. And we're not given the entire conversation, but he's so wise and so tactful that he stalls his own execution long enough to hear the story. Ariok, I get this, this is crazy. Ariok then explained the matter to Daniel. What? What? It seems like Daniel is one of these, one of these pe- people that others listen to. Daniel is one of these people that, that, that others leaned into. The, the willingness, think about this, of powerful, powerful people like Ashpenaz last week or Ariok this week to take their time with Daniel is evidence that he was actually an incredible listener. He was very interested, not just interesting. In fact, the key to being interesting is to be interested, right? He is tactful. He is respectful all the time, not just when he needs to be. And because of that, he's the kind of people, the kind of person that that people kind of lean into, including, by the way, people who are very different from him. And I think we could all take a page from Daniel's playbook, especially during times like this, so wise, so tactful, that Ariok takes the time to explain the matter. And get this, he's actually able 
to stall the executions, not just his own, but all of them, and request an audience with the king. At this, Daniel went and requested that the king, now I don't, I don't know who he went and requested this of, perhaps Ashpenaz, who we met last week, the, the chief of the court officials, like the chief of staff, but he's able to get a time with the king the next day so that he might interpret the dream for him. He initiates an appointment with Nebuchadnezzar, not knowing at all how it's going to play out. He has no further content that says, and just like last week, he's acting in complete faith and complete trust that unlike the astrologers and enchanters and magicians, his God not only can but does reveal. That his God communicates with people. Well, having secured that appointment, he immediately goes back to his friends and urges them to pray, right? He goes back to his house. He explains the matter to his three friends. We're given their Hebrew names here. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah urges them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, this thing that's hidden so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men from Babylon. And they pray, and I bet they prayed. I bet they prayed hard because they would all die tomorrow if there is no such thing as a God who reveals himself to us, they will all die tomorrow if God does not show up in this space that they have now once again created for him and reveal to them what's up. And so, but there is a God like that, and God does. And get this, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. During the night, Daniel has a dream, and it's the weirdest dream. It's like this strange, strange dream, and Daniel somehow knows this is the dream. This is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, and Daniel knows what it means. And this is, by the way, one of the themes, not only of Daniel's entire story, but especially of chapter 2, that God reveals that God reveals. In fact, the Greek word for reveal is the word ap apocalypto, from which we get the word apocalypse, right? And to us, uh, uh, an ap apocalypse, that word, that word refers to the end of the world, right? It's something as apocalyptic. It's, in fact, things have felt a little apocalyptic the last few months, haven't they? It's like things are just weird. Like it just feels like everything's over. And that to us is what the word means. And so Daniel and his book and, and other, and his dreams and visions are often put in this category of apocalyptic literature. And books like his and like the book of Revelation, they are often then and treat it as like these code books. These code books that if you read them through the right lens and you have the, the, like the color code or something, they are, they are the code for inter interpreting events, including current events, for identifying key players, for predicting the future and the end of the world. But the word apocalypse just means to reveal. To reveal things that were previously hidden or, or mysterious. And the idea of apocalyptic or apocalypse has to do with so much more than the end of the world. It has to do with seeing our world, including what is happening in our world through God's perspective. Apocalypse. Apocalypse is what happens to you when God's way of seeing the world happens to you. Apocalypse is what happens when God's way of seeing the world happens to you, and this is what happens to Daniel. God's way of seeing the world happens to him, and he wakes up the next morning, and he says a prayer, a prayer that he eventually maybe turns in. I don't, I don't know if he said it in a poem that morning or if he eventually turned it into a poem or song that he now records for us that I think is key to understanding the chapter and how Daniel understood the significance of this moment in his life. And so then Daniel praised the God of heaven, and he said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. Wisdom and power belong to him. They are his to give. He changes the times and the seasons, which was contrary to the worldview and the lore of the Babylonians and the, the Enuma Elish. He changes the times and the seasons. He deposes kings and raises others up. Now, this is massively important to understanding Daniel's point of view on the world and how he tells his, tells his story because Daniel believes that humans are actually the image, or the Hebrew word is the tselem of God. That human beings are created in the tselem, the, the, the image of God, created to reflect the glory and the dignity and the goodness, the rule of God to the rest of creation. And therefore, power 
and wisdom and leadership and influence that belongs to God is shared freely with his images, his talim, and it is a stewardship that he shares this with us, that the creator God shares wisdom and power with us to reflect his wisdom and power to his creation. And so his power are his, and then he goes on to say, and he gives wisdom, he gives power, and he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals, he apocalypses deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in the darkness, and light dwells with him. And then he says, I thank you. And praise you, God of my ancestors. I haven't forgotten my roots. They changed my name. They changed my look. They changed my language. I know where I'm from. You, you have given me wisdom and power. It's a gift. It's a stewardship. It belongs to you and you've given them me. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. And now, armed with his fresh apocalypse, with his revelation, the revelation of this mystery, Daniel hurries off to find Arioch and stay the execution of thousands of terrified men in Babylon, in Babylon which is, by the way, characteristically generous of Daniel. It's a characteristically generous move on his part that he saves all of their lives, not just his own. By the way, men who disagreed with him on pretty much everything, including things that were not trivial. They disagree on politics. They disagree on religion and faith. They disagree on humanity and anthropology and, and how you treat human beings. They, they disagree on everything. Men he most likely believes are charlatans. And men, by the way, who are his seniors. And I mean, think about it. With them all out of the way, it's pretty much a straight shot for him to the top of the food chain he saves all of their lives. Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. And so, I love so Arioch takes Daniel to the king at once, and it says, I love this, I have found a man. He's taking full credit. It's like, I went and I found a man from among the exiles in Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. And now, for possibly the second time in his life, the second time in the story, Daniel stands before the most powerful man in the world. In fact, historical records tell us that Nebuchadnezzar had live lions chained to the sides of his throne just to intimidate people, to show his power. He was the original Tiger King. You got it. He was the original Tiger King, and he is not happy today because his, all of his executions got delayed, and so he's not happy, and he gets right to the point, and, he, and the king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, we, we found that out last week, listen, are you able to tell me the dream and interpret it? I don't even want to play with this. There's no smoke and mirrors here. We're not doing the dance we did last week. Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Nebuchadnezzar is understandably skeptical, and he's ready to get on with it. And Daniel <laughs> replied, I love this. I love this so much. He's like 20, 21 years old. And he begins to set this up. He begins to set this up, to focus Nebuchadnezzar's mind in a direction, building on what he heard that the other enchanters had told Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel replied, no wise man or enchanter or magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he's asked about. The others weren't wrong on that point, but, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mystery. The courage, you get this? Like the courage of this young 20-something-year-old Daniel to publicly and unashamedly, unapologetically point the most powerful man in the world to God. And he does it in such a culturally sensitive way. There is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven. Now, Nebuchadnezzar believed that there was a God in heaven. His capital was stuffed with thousands of temples to them. But none like this one who reveals mysteries. And he has shown Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. And then he says, your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were laying on your bed are these. And Nebuch as Nebuchadnezzar sits stupefied, Daniel begins to describe the dream in vivid detail, as if with first-hand knowledge, as if he's seen in himself, your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue. Now, the Hebrew word for statue is the same word for image or idol. It's tselem. 
that we are created in the tellum of God. And the reason why human beings are not to create images or tellim of God is because God has always already created tellim of himself, images of himself. You and I, the person sitting next to you, is the image of God. There in front of you in the desert, in your mind, you saw this huge tellum. This image, this idol, and it was enormous, and it was dazzling. It was awesome in its appearance, gleaming in the desert sun, huge. And the head of the tzelem, the image, was made of pure gold. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar's dream started every night. Just gold and brilliant and beautiful. Back up one. Yeah, no, you got it. Yeah, beautiful and gleaming in the sun. And Nebuchadnezzar would think, oh. It's so beautiful. It's so glorious. But then the scene, you know how dreams are. They're weird. And he starts to go, but it's not all gold. There's, there's something wrong with this statue. It's, its chest and its arms are silver. Its belly is, and its thighs are, are, are bronze. Its legs of iron. And, and then as the scene kind of shifts, he sees the feet. And this is the scary part of the dream. The, the, the feet are partly iron. And partly of baked clay, like the clay that Nebuchadnezzar's workforce made bricks out of to build his amazing city. And, and Nebuchadnezzar knows as he looks at the feet of this statue, this image, this statue can't stand. <laughs> it, it is doomed. This is the dream, by the way. This is the scene from which we get the phrase feet of clay. This, this statue has feet of clay, which must have felt very disturbing to Nebuchadnezzar. What does it all mean? What's it trying to tell me? It gets worse. While he's staring at the feet, while you were watching the, st the tellum, the statue, the image, there is a rock, and, we're, and dreams are weird, right? There's this rock all of a sudden, and it's getting cut out of a quarry or a mountainside. We don't know, but there's no one cutting it out. There, there are no human beings cutting out this huge rock. It's not by human hands. And all of a sudden, the rock is flying through the air. It strikes the statue on its feet made of iron and clay and smashes them. But the statue doesn't just topple over and fall. It like instantly vaporizes. It just goes poof. And the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were broken into pieces and became like chaff like dust settling to the threshing floor in the summer. And as the, as the dust, as the particles settle to the ground, this hot desert wind, you know what that feels like, right? A, a Santa Ana sweeps through the desert and blows the entire thing away without leaving a trace as if it had never been. And Nebuchadnezzar is like, this is not good. This is not a good dream. What does it mean? Is this a warning? Is there a coup? What's the rock? Who's the rock? It's somebody trying to take my kingdom from me. And then as he stares at this like vacant land, desert landscape, the rock, this is weird, begins to grow. You know how dreams are. The rock begins to grow and grow and grow and grow until it becomes a mountain and grows and grows and grows further until this huge mountain fills the entire earth. Now that is a weird dream. That's a strange dream. And Nebuchadnezzar listens, his jaw on the crown, as Daniel has described it in perfect detail. You can imagine he is all ears for what comes next. And then Daniel interprets it. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. And the God of heaven, remember that one I talked to you about just a second ago, has given you dominion and power and might and glory. God has given. God has given because power is a derivative. It's a stewardship. It's a gift. He has given you a share of his own power and might and glory. And in your hands, he has placed all of mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky, which sounds weird. Like, what's with the birds and the beasts? But this is language from Genesis chapter 1. This is language from when human beings were created in the tellum, the image of God to rule as reflections of God's own goodness and wisdom, all of creation, the birds of the uh, sky and the beasts of the field. And see, this is part of Daniel's worldview. This is how he sees humanity. This is his worldview, but it's not Nebuchadnezzar's, and it's not Babylon's worldview, and it's not their anthropology. And by the way, it's really not ours anymore either. This is no longer how we see all human beings either. And Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, which <laughs> makes him feel 
kind of good at first. But, he says, but after you, another kingdom will rise. See, Nebuchadnezzar, you and your kingdom are temporary. It will not last forever, and you will not last forever. A kingdom will arise inferior to earth, and then there's going to be a third one that will arise, rule over the whole earth, and then a fourth one, finally a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things into pieces, so this kingdom will crush and break all the others, because this is what human kingdoms do. Rather than seeing power and leadership as stewardship, as something that has been shared, that doesn't belong to us. It has been given, placed in our hands by God to be handled with generosity and gratitude. And rather than reflecting that power back into the world as images of God with goodness and integrity and justice and generosity, we break and smash and crush. Violence is not only the way of power, it is so often seen as the way to try to get some power. That's what human kingdoms seem to do. And then, then Daniel adds, and just as you saw that the feet of the toes were partly baked in clay and partly iron, that whole weird thing. So this will be a divided kingdom. And it'll have some strength of iron to it, even as you saw iron mixed with the clay. And then Daniel starts to add all of this detail. And this is the stuff that fascinates interpreters. This is the stuff of prophecy conferences that they treat as the code to try to understand what's going on in the world. And as the toes, you know, were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with the baked clay, so the people will be a mixture Though they won't be united any more than iron mixes with clay. And we're like, wow, that's fascinating. I wonder who it is. I wonder who he's talking about. What kingdom is this? What empire is this? Is this us? Is this America? I mean, we're mixed and we're not united, right? Is he talking about ancient Greece? Is he talking about the Roman Empire? What, I mean, what's the code? What's the code? But the dream isn't over yet. In fact, we're just getting to the point. In the time of those kings, Daniel says, the God of heaven. The one I told you about earlier will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, not just your kingdom, all kingdoms, all kingdoms on this earth are temporary, including, by the way, this one, the one that we're in. And someday God will set up a kingdom. It will be the kingdom of God, a phrase that was always on Jesus's lips. The time is near. There has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The message of Jesus and the message of the first followers of Jesus is there is another kingdom. There is another kingdom that operates completely differently than this kingdom, and it will cover the earth. There's another kingdom, he says, set up by God. It will never be destroyed, and it will, he adds, it will crush all those other kingdoms. Like, whoa, John, wait, what? It will crush them? That sounds violent. Hang on and come back for week seven of the series as we pick up this dream in a little bit more detail. And, and as, as Daniel unpacks it later in his story, but he says, and it'll bring them to an end, but it itself, it will endure forever. There will be an eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God. And it's an apocalypse. It's an apocalypse. It's a revelation. Like God has pulled back the curtain of history. And Daniel says, the great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. And Nebuchadnezzar is gobsmacked. I mean, you could knock him over with a feather. And before you know it, he is down off his tiger king throne and he is prostrate, prostrate in front of Daniel, paying him honor and ordering, this is weird, that an offering and incense be presented to him. So I'm 21. People are burning incense to me right now. This is strange. Okay, okay. And then the king said to Daniel, surely <laughs> your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. That's your God. A revealer of mysteries for you were able to reveal this mystery. And then true to his word, true to his word, the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. And he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge. Think of this placed him in charge of all of the wise men, all of those enchanters and astrologers and divinations, men who believe and approach things in a completely different way than Daniel does. And now, like, he's their direct report. 
Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed, and now he uses their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Now, there is so much going on in this story that we will flesh out, that gets fleshed out through the rest of the book, and we will flesh out through the rest of the series, and I hope you'll continue to join us next week for part three and on through the series. But there's so much going on in the story, like what it means to be human. What does it mean to be a human, to reflect the image of God? And that wisdom and power are gifts, that they're derivative. They come from God who shares them willingly and freely with us, his image bearers, his salim. And they are to be stewarded humbly as gifts because they are not mine. They are God's. They're being shared with me to be handled gratefully and generously. And this is something that Daniel came to believe as a teenage P-O-W, and it becomes the theme of his life. Or, or this big idea that God reveals his perspective so that we can see as he sees. That God is a revealer of mysteries, that, that unlike the, the gods of the magicians and the enchanters, God reveals his perspective so we can see as he sees, and that apocalyptic isn't about cracking a code. It's about being able to see as God sees so I can do as God would do, so that I can reflect him well. In this world, in the environments, the events, the experiences I'm having. But it's what Daniel sees. It's what he sees. And it's what he came to understand because of what he saw that, that gave him such incredible courage and clarity and conviction that next day that he would then carry with him through the rest of his tenure as an advisor and a wise man to the kings of Babylon and Persia. It is this that I hope as we end today, that we will see and that we will carry it with us into the days that we're living through right now and just maybe possibly into the rest of our lives. Because as interpreters debate on which kingdoms are which and what the code is, the point of the story, the point of the story is this. There we go. Now you know the next point too. Evil always looks like it's going to win right before it doesn't. Evil always looks like it's going to win right before it doesn't. And it seems to be the story of Daniel's life. It, it, it's, the story, it's the story of his day-to-day -day life. It's the story of his dream, these glorious empires, so invincible, these violent kingdoms that crush others and rule the world, a violent, godless kingdom that crushed his own homeland. Evil always looks like it's going to win. It's, it always looks like it's going to win, and maybe that has felt like your story a little bit too. You, the, the unexpected diagnosis, the loss of a loved one or the loss of love, the loss of a job, this global pandemic that kills your dreams and kills that business that you spent your lifetime building that was just on the verge of making it. And, and there are moments in our lives where it seems like life is working against us and evil is going to win. It's like everything you were counting on, everything you were building towards vaporizes in front of your eyes. Evil always looks like it's going to win, doesn't it? Right before it doesn't. And here's why that's key. Because if you live your life as though evil might win, if you live your life as if evil stands a chance, then you will find yourself negotiating with it dancing with it, bending to it, compromising with it, because maybe there are some things you can do to be on the winning side if evil turns out to win. And if you live as if evil might actually win, fear will always be with you. And this, this to me is the power of young 20-something Daniel. Though the city of his birth has been defeated, though the temple of his God will soon be leveled by this very king, by the way, though he has been taken as a prisoner of war to work for the glory of his enemy, though again and again and again, it looks like his life is going to be taken from him for no fault of his own because he's trying to do the right thing. Because of what he has seen, Daniel chooses a course for his life, and he is never afraid. He is never afraid, never fearful, always faithful, never fearful, always faithful, a faith, by the way, that consistently seems to express itself in this wise, dignified, generous love and care for his enemies. So let me ask you, if you could see the end of your story, 
If you could see the end of your story, if you could see how God wins at the end of your story, how he brings it all together for you, for your good, as the Apostle Paul would later write in his letter to the Romans, for we know that God is at work in all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to him. If you could see how that played out, if you could see that in your life, how would that change the way you're living this chapter of it? If you could see the end of your story, how would that change the way you're living this chapter of it? Would it maybe change your mood a little bit? Would it maybe change your confidence, your generosity, your faithfulness, your integrity? If you could see how God sees, if you could see how God sees your story and the end of it, you would do as God would do. And in the belly of the evil empire itself, Daniel sees the end of the story, an end which is actually just the beginning. God wins. God wins, and he will live the rest of his life for that eternal kingdom. How about you? How about you? Let's close in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, just I am humbled, humbled by the character, the integrity, the wisdom, the faithfulness, the sensitivity, the cultural awareness of this 21-year-old, probably young man, Daniel, I think many of us probably are, would that we had just a little bit of that going into our week ahead. And so I just want to pray for all of us, Uh, some of us desperately needing to see, as you see, that maybe Daniel's vision of how the story ends would influence how we live this chapter of it. That maybe as we come to terms with the fact that evil always looks like it's winning right before it doesn't, that that would change how we walk into this next day, into these days that we are living in, these times that we live in, and that we would have the character and the faithfulness, the integrity of this young 21-year-old man who decided his life would honor you and he would live fearlessly and faithfully in it. God, I pray that for all of us, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, uh, thank you again so much for joining us in the room and online if you're watching online. Uh, By the way, before you check out, before you sign off online or before you leave the room, please take a second to fill out uh, that Connect card uh, that you have on the app. That is the next slide. There it is. Uh, And for you dads in the room, don't forget to write, hey, I'm a dad. Here's my favorite takeout because we definitely want to buff a bunch of you out. Talk about winner, winner chicken dinner. Unless, of course, you like steak. Uh, So fill that out, uh, your Connect card. Also, of course, this this season has been so incredibly generous. If you are able to give at this time, please take a moment uh, and give. You can give on our app, of course, and you can give online. If you're watching this on our watch page, it is just in the upper right-hand corner where you can click give. And you can mail in checks to Terranova. And if you're in the building, we have envelopes actually outside in our lobby as you walk out. You can grab a few of those, take them home, or you can actually fill one out and drop it in that basket that's right there before you leave. Hey, thank you again for being here. God bless you guys. May you live with the character of a teenage young man named Daniel this week, and we'll see you back next weekend for part three of our series, Against the Flow. Thanks for coming today. 